So let's go back and start talking about cues of safety or danger. And the cues of safety, we want to start deconstructing what we're seeing. There are cues of safety that you're seeing in the facial expressions, even in these seals. Because seals are mammals, they're aquatic mammals, humans are mammals, and we use our face in similar ways. Our face conveys cues to the other, and our face actually, uh, we're literally wearing our heart on our face. And this is not merely a simple metaphor that you've heard, this is true to its underlying neurophysiology. And this is part of the polyvagal theory, because the neural regulation of the face, especially the upper part of the face, where all these subtle cues are coming from, the neural regulation of that is linked to a vagal pathway to your heart that calms you down. Okay? And that system is also linked to the ability to be prosodic in your voice, to be melodic, and it triggers the middle ear muscles. You're going to get the whole talk in a few seconds now. It triggers the middle ear muscles, something that no one ever thinks about or talks about, the middle ear muscles to dampen background sounds so that you can only hear human voice or hear human voice with a great advantage. And I always like to describe that as the college years because we all know about that during the college years when we'd go into bars, which would be quite noisy. We meet someone, we look at that person, uh, Paul Revere's, remember the place? Yeah. Uh, I just found out that Ellen went to Michigan State, so she would know these places. Um, and it may, might be very noisy, but if you met someone and looked at them and talked to them, you could hear every word they were saying, and the background sound would dampen. And we have a, a usually attributed that to attentiveness and focus, but there's a physics to it, because when we attend to the person and like that person with the eye gaze, the reciprocity, and the attunement, we are changing the transfer function of our middle ear muscles. We're changing the sounds that get into our brain. And we're emphasizing the melodic frequencies of human voice. Okay? So when we look at people's faces, we know whether or not they can understand or hear us. And of course, when you deal with couples and you deal with arguments, you know that when people are making an argument, the other person doesn't hear a word they're saying. It's because they have already zoned out, we would say. You look at their eyes, you look at their face. It's like uh, reprimanding your child. You'll get the same type of lack of understanding. So we can look at this, and what do we see here? We see proximity, and we see a, a, uh, there's not a defensiveness of being close to the person. We see proximity, engage, and intention. But what we're going to continue to look at and focus on is really the eye-to-eye, -eye, face to face the proximity and the utilization of the upper part of the face. And some of those cues are subtle, like you can see on the eyes, but our body, our neurophysiology, responds to these subtle cues so profoundly that it changes who we are. So as a couple, when a couple is not, you know, where the person is turning away, when they're engaged, while the other person is trying to engage, there's a physiological reaction, uh, you would call it rejection, but the person has engaged and is, and is trying to give and now is functionally being reprimanded for engaging. And here, what is critical about the, this relationship, it's not the height differential, it's the fact that there's conforming in the hug. It's a good hug. And of course, those of you who've had children know that when your child is fussy or difficult and you try to hug the baby, the baby's head will be thrown back. And we'll see that this also occurs in adults who are not good at giving hugs. Their body becomes rigid. And it's not functionally a voluntary behavior. You can't say, hey, relax, let me give you a hug. The cues to the body are creating this defensiveness and this reactivity.